Come funziona questo? Ok. Ok. Well, can you hear me? Just fine? Well, I will like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to honor Giorgio. As uh, some of you know, the, I came to Rome in 1999, so almost 20 years ago, uh, for a two years postdoc, but I, at the end I stayed here for four years. So this should tell you that I was quite happy here. And it was indeed a, a wonderful time. Uh, I think I, I met a lot of nice, interesting people. This is, of course, a beautiful city. But above all, the physics here was just great. I mean, I remember waking up in the morning very excited of what was going to go on, on the day in the department. And it still remains one of the most beautiful times of my scientific life. So thank you so much, Giorgio, for this. And I still have as a great pleasure talking to you, but I have a very nice remembrance from those times. So the work I want to talk to you today has been done in collaboration. The Janus collaboration is a relatively large one by the standards of condensed matter physics. It is a collaboration between physicists from five universities in Spain and Italy. Some of us are physicists, others are engineers, and what we do, oh sorry, what we do is to uh, build up computers which are specifically designed for some very specific type of simulations in physics. Some of the partners in the, in the um, collaboration are from Rome, and all of them are in this room. Andrea, uh, Giorgio, Enzo, and Federico. I, I, I mean, I saw him, he's around. Uh, but there are also people from Madrid, and from Zaragoza, and also from Ferrara, and Juan Jesus Ruiz Lorenzo, who's arriving uh, today, later. So, <coughs> this is the, the sketch of the talk. I will give a, a short introduction to spin glasses. I apologize to Asper, there are many in the room, but uh, so these people can take these slides as that I can just set in my notations, but maybe other people will like it. Then I will say a few words about our supercomputer, Janus II. Sometimes I call it Janus II, but uh, the official name is Janus II. Um, and then I will give some uh, recent results, which are both on the linear response regime and in the non-linear response regime. OK. So uh, spin glasses are a very particular type of uh, glass. They are random uh, magnetic systems. They have some sort of phase transition. But really, we do not, by just looking to the, to the man the by eye, one just doesn't know how the spins freeze. There is no way of recognizing a, an ordering pattern there. If you perform a neutron scattering experiment, for instance, the structure factor is flat. You don't recognize any, any time, nothing. But anyway, they are frozen. We have a, some sort of a standard model for it, which is the, the Edward Anderson model. And we do know, it, it was not easy to establish, but we do know that the frozen or the, uh, the freezing is due to a thermodynamic glass transition. Hmm? to some sort of phase transition in, a th in, the, in the true thermodynamic way. What makes spin glasses interesting is the combination of frustration and disorder. So frustration, many of you know it, means that when you take, uh, in, in the simplest case of a graph of a plaquette, which you take the signs of the couplings, which can be either positive or negative. Positive means a ferromagnetic coupling, negative means an antiferromagnetic, so the spins wants to be opposite to the other. If the product of the signs along the plaquette is negative, there is no way of satisfying all the assignments there. It is impossible to find an assignment for the spins that satisfy all the interactions there. Now, it turns out that the, the graph in which you uh, formulate the spin glass is not planar. The problem of finding the ground state, the energy minimizing assignment, is MP complete. So this makes it very interesting from the point of view of computational science. And uh, there has been, a, well, people yesterday was talking a lot about that. There has been a lot of relations between the theory of the spin glasses and computer science and complexity. Broadly speaking, as Julio said before, the important thing is that there is a very raw landscape. If we make a, a cartoon here in which we plot the free energy and one of those configurational uh, coordinates, 
uh, the profile is very rough with many minima and subtle bones, etc. However, we need to describe this. And the way in which theory that, uh, theories do it is by introducing the Edward Anderson order parameter. But basically, because the spins are frozen, one will, in a random sign, one takes the time average of the square of that freezing thing. So this can be either positive or negative, but if you square it, it is always positive. And in the low temperature phase, this is frozen. Another way of taking this uh, square is using two clones. I mean, two independent systems, which are being evolving with different thermal noise, but exactly the same couplings. And of course, if you take the product of these independent things, you're squaring the, the other parameter. But keep in mind that this is a third game. Experimentalists have no access to this uh, microscopic configuration. Okay, theories can play this game, can take copies of the system, which is exactly the same thing. Have, we have access to the microscopic configuration and can do whatever we like with it. So this, uh, experimentalists cannot. Okay? So we need to work a little bit to talk to our experimentalist colleagues. But anyhow, we, uh, I am theory, so I, I can play this game. So let us see how it works. Those two are real spin glass configurations from a 3D system. To plot them planar, what I'm doing is uh, making a projection on the plane. So those are very large systems with 160 to the cube spins. I'm projecting them to uh, a plane. So each of these points is the average of the 160 spins which are along the visual line. They can be either uh, blue or yellow, depending on whether this is spin up or spin down. We choose blue and yellow because the average is gray, as you see. Basically, there are as many uh, uh, blue or yellow spins along each line, and this looks random. But if you superpose the two images, this is what you get. There are order here. So one of the copies of the system is basically providing a pattern against which you can measure the other. And you see that there is this order in that region. OK? So, now that we know uh, what the overlap is, we have theories for it. And there are two basic competing theories for the, well, there are more, but I would say that the most popular ones are these two uh, theories for the spin glass phase. One is the droplet theory, in which the probability distribution function for the overlap is just like the one for a ferromagnet. You can be either uh, spin up or overlap up or overlap down. And there are no more states. So this looks very much like a disguised ferromagnet. This theory basically arises from the migdal cadenov approximation. Okay? This is the, the, the basic uh, um, theoretical support for it. And it, it is like a disguised ferromagnet, but there is a basic important difference. There are ghost and bosons there. Hmm? Even if this is the script system, there are ghost and bosons. OK. On the other hand, we have Giorgio theory, which is the replica symmetry breaking. This arises from a, a mean field solution. And I would say that most people like this nowadays that this is valid about the upper critical dimension, which is 6. There is a real challenge to extend the theory below the upper critical dimension. There have been some attempts of making an epsilon expansion, but uh, of course, uh, I defer any question to Giorgio. He's the expert on that. Um, one of the basic features is that if we look at the probability distribution function, we do have two delta peaks, like in the droplet feature, but we also have a continuous pair in between. Any overlap in between these two extremal values is possible. Okay? And also there's a very important difference with the droplet feature is that all the citations are space, space filling. Okay? However, these two pictures refer to equilibrium physics, which is not the experimental situation. In experiments, everything with a low enough temperature uh, is carried out and out of equilibrium simulation, in out of equilibrium situation. So just to explain what I mean, I'm uh, bringing here this uh, beautiful experiment by Harrison and Ocho, in which they tried um, the fluctuation dissipation ratio. So what these people did is to 
take a spin glass at a very low temperature, below the, the critical temperature, they cool it in a field, in a small field, a small enough to make sure to be on the, on the linear response regime, and then switch off the field. When the field is switched off, the magnetization starts to drop. However, the, time, the, the, the preparation time was varied a lot, by two orders of magnitude, from, say, one minute to three hours. And then the record, both the decay of the magnetization and the correlation, the correlation function, which is the, essentially the magnetization at the, uh, the rate, at the product of the magnetization, the time which the field was switched off, and the magnetization at a later time. And as you see in the experimental results, in both cases, we are very far from an equilibrium uh, situation. The, of course, the response, which is the, the decay of ma the magnetization, is much cleaner than the correlation. There are huge errors in the, in the correlation function. But anyway, in both cases, one can recognize a very strong dependence on the waiting time. So this is clearly not a situation of equilibrium. And when one tries to analyze the situation, the only time scale that you can recognize in the problem is the waiting time itself. <coughs> so, at this point, I can introduce the numerical scheme that we have followed. We will work in basically in, in, in all the results uh, I'm presenting here in this scheme. We will go to temperature which is below the glass one. We we'll wait for waiting time, and then we'll switch on the experimentally switch off, but I will switch on a magnetic field at the waiting time. Of course, when you switch on the magnetic field, the magnetization, which was essentially zero, starts to grow, and we will record it. And in this response function, there will be a linear piece, but also nonlinear contributions. Okay? The linear piece was analyzed in this paper in the, by the Janus collaboration in last year. And the nonlinear response, we also analyzed it last year, but there's some new data, this, which are the ones I was telling you about today. We will also study correlation functions. This will be very important. And there are many correlation functions. The ones I'm describing here is the simplest one. Basically, the, this uh, two times correlation function uh, records how much memory you have at the later time t plus tw of the configuration at the initial time, at the preparation time as t. As you see also in the numerical simulation, not only in the experiments, we have a very strong dependence on the correlation function with the initial time. The black line here is supposed to be, um, I mean, our estimate of the Edward Anderson or the parameter, the equilibrium value at that temperature, okay? As, as you see, there is a very strong, mind the, the log scale here, there is a very strong uh, dependence on the waiting time. Oop. Ah, yes, okay. So, <clears throat> besides that, which are correlations that depend on two times, we will also be considering correlation that depends on two sides, but at the same time, okay? We would have is two clones of the system, which are, with them we form the replica film, and then correlate replica fields at separate points. Mind that the two clones live at the same time, okay? Those are, remember the, car, the, the picture I showed before, of the, of the overlapping? Uh, this correlation can be long range, and then, we use this sort of fan set in which we have an algebraic decay and a cutoff function, which depends on the ratio or the distance with some characteristic length, to uh, get from this correlation function the spin glass correlation length. Okay? Um, just as a first approximation, let me say that this is a very similar to a coarsening phenomenon in the sense that this uh, characteristic length grows with time very slowly though. Mind that this exponent zeta t, which we, we will call that the aging rate later on, is very large. At the critical point is about seven, and it is larger at lower, a lower temperature. So it takes a really huge amount of time to make this correlation length to grow, okay? 
And uh, this is a, a side technical result. If one is doing a simulation, you should make sure that the size of the lattice should be large enough to both size effect. Okay? So we had two, basically two lengths here, the lattice size and the, and the correlation length one reach. One needs to make sure that the lattice, are, the lattice is quite larger than, say, about seven times larger than the correlation length. So at this point, I can, uh, I'm ready to ask the questions that I, I wish we should be addressing here. The point is, as I said, we have uh, theories which basically um, regard equilibrium. On the other hand, we know that the experiments are not carried out in equilibrium. So one may ask if these theories are relevant at all for experiments, right? Well, the answer would be positive, and this was this arises from our study of the linear response regime, and it was uh, and, and the related fluctuation dissipation relations. On the other hand, we will see that to make profit of this relation, one need to um, have a very strong command about the growth of the correlation length, and this. Um, requires considering the nonlinear response. And in this sense, it is maybe worth calling a beautiful new set of experiments that is, are being carried out in Texas, in the, in the Austin group, in which the, the, the experimental accuracy is uh, huge as compared to any previous thing. So this is the, the work by Orbach and his collaborators. What these people do is they grow beautiful spin glass uh, samples on a film geometry. Okay, doors are very large along the transversal directions, but they are a very short um, um, transversal dimension. This means that this is an experiment with a very well set uh, length, length scale. Now, using the nonlinear response, these people are able to record the time in which the spin glass correlation length reach the, the, the width of the film. So, I think. I might be wrong, but I think that this is the first time in the, in the field of, uh, of glassy physics in which on the same experiments, people are measuring both times and length scale on the same footing. Mm? And those are uh, really very, very accurate experimental results in which they find some sort of power law or cosining uh, growth of the correlation length with an exponent that it depends on the temperature, but the prefactor is huge. Let me remind you that in all the simulations before by the Janus group, but also by Matteo Luli and Giappelisetto and Giorgio, uh, everybody finds value here around 7. While in the experiment, they are finding a, a value which is much closer to 10. Okay? So what's going on here? Okay? This, was, this will be one of the questions uh, I will try to address today. Well, it turns out that to make any progress, we have, been, we have needed this uh, beautiful computer, this Janus II computer. So <coughs> let me now tell you a little bit about the, the machine. So the machine is quite peculiar because the, uh, the processing units are not CPUs nor GPUs, but field programmable gates array. So those, as some of you know probably, those are the things that engineers use to simulate chips. Hmm? Before making a silicon chip, you need to simulate it. And there are these uh, beautiful things in which you can program how the chip, the real chip, will work if you uh, print it on silicon. And this is what we did. We basically, um, well, not me, but other people in the collaboration, they basically uh, prepare a chip which was uh, designed on purpose for this sort of simulation. This is why it can it's not a silicon chip, it's, it's a simulation of a chip, but anyway, it delivers tremendous uh, computing power. The, we have 256 of these uh, wonderful computing units, and uh, say, just to give you an idea of what is going on, you can have a very large system. Remember, we need to have large system in order not to have size effects, finite size effects, and then we can simulate it for about 
uh, 10 to the 11 um, Monte Carlo step, which is the equivalent of a tenth of a second in physical time, in something like a month. Okay? The previous generation, Janus first, could do about the same, but at a much smaller uh, lattice, something like uh, up to 80, I mean half of the size. Half of the size. In more graphical terms, it, uh, as I told you before, the time scale of typical experiments is from one hour uh, from one second to one hour, I would say. And in conventional computers, people are exploring something like one microsecond, 10 microsecond, maybe 100 microseconds. Janus goes to a tenth of a second, okay? So it's a, a real step forward. However, you could ask rightly what is uh, what we gain. I mean, a mere factor of two doesn't seem so much going from L to the 80 in, that we did in L equal 80 that we did in 2008 from 160 that we have just done. So just to convince you that there is some difference here, I'm plotting the growth of this uh, spin glass correlation length. Hmm? The horizontal line here marks the starting of the size effect, so you shouldn't trust on a L equal 80 system, you shouldn't trust anything which happens about this uh, black line. And then, well, we have been for many years, 10 years already, very happy with this data. I mean, those were a real world record, and we reached very large correlation lengths. Our errors were pretty small, I would say. I mean, we were happy with that. However, those are the new data. Can you compare them? I mean, there are error bars there. You cannot see them, but there are. We plot them, I swear it. It's just the, the smaller than the width of the line. In fact, there are correlation functions here, and we have measured correlation functions for some six orders of magnitude. <coughs> Part of it is, of course, that it is much better to have a larger lattice in which you can just forget about size effect because things are larger. But another part of it was some sort of a, um, how could I say, a fortunate coincidence. For some of the reasons, we were interested in studying not just two clones, but many. And now it happens that uh, the thermal errors, which, I mean, having many clones of the same system can kill errors related to thermal fluctuation, not er errors uh, uh, related to the fluctuations induced by the couplings, okay? But we were interested in having many clones, and it turned out that the thermal fluctuations are dominant in the regime. So the killing of the thermal fluctuation produced <coughs> really, really accurate results. Okay? So this is, we have uh, now to play with correlation lens, which extend to uh, almost 20 uh, lattice spacing with a huge accuracy. Okay? It is clear that we can see things that we couldn't see before. So, let me now start the discussion of physical results. How much time do I have? Hmm? Okay. Okay, try to be quick. Okay, so <clears throat> as many of you know, the fluctuation dissipation theorem that relates the linear response to the field to the correlation function needs to be extended out of equilibrium, okay? This was achieved, I would say, 25 years ago uh, through the fluctuation dissipation relation, in which on the left hand side remains as it is, but on the right hand side, what we have is the integral between the correlation function and one, this is maximum value for the correlation, of course, of <coughs> the Parisi order parameter. The Parisi, I mean, is the primitive or the, in, uh, the integrated uh, probability distribution function for the, for the order parameter. Now, <coughs> this uh, produces a relation, maybe instructed, between the static, the feature, the static feature one has in mind, of the third is one half, say the dropped feature here, and the shape of these things. So how this works? At very short times after the, after the waiting time, the correlation function is very large. As time passes by, the correlation decreases. At some point, it reaches the Edward Anderson order parameter, and during all this time, this uh, integral was one. So we are getting the one minus c of the, of the uh, fluctuation dissipation term. But then it hits 
the, the delta function there, it changes and goes to a constant value. So this is the standard shape of the fluctuation dissipation ratio for the for a, um, droplet model, say. However, on the replica symmetry breaking here, the, the, in the integral has a dependence on C because of this continuous part of the P of Q. And so this should bend, okay? This should be some curvature there. So one could think that this could produce an experimental measurement of the paresis functional order parameter, okay? However, one should be aware of the fact there are two wild extrapolations involved in that dream, okay? One is related to the time. It is better to think of the correlation function as on the time, but remember that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, as time goes by, the correlation function decreases. So, on the left-hand side, for this, uh, the Cuyandolo, Kurchan, France relations, on the left-hand side, the waiting time, the experimental waiting time, should go to infinite. Okay? On the right hand side, which is this is the this is the experimental world, say this is the theoretical world. On the right hand side in the theoretical world, the size of the system should be infinite too. And both limits are essentially impossible to, to consider. On the experimental side, if you if want to have a look to the to the data by Harrison and Osio, you see this is the ratio, the fluctuation ratio they got and how it varies with the waiting time. As you see, the waiting time varies a lot, say by two orders of magnitude, and see how, this, how small the evolution is. And these people needed to extrapolate to infinite time here, which is here, okay? So this is still a rather long extrapolation. On the third side of the, of the thing, one needs to compute the, the P of Q, the probability distribution function, and use this to compute the integrals. And those are the best results available, Worldwide, I would say, those are the ones from the Janus group, in which we compute the POQ for different system size. And even if the results are very clear and they point to a replica symmetry breaking scenario, etc., you will agree that there is a very large size dependence there. So, what can we do? Well, maybe we can be more modest. We can just use the the limiting expression and try to use it on a finite system and a finite time. So in this way, what we're getting is a relationship between correlation function and time. Remember that correlation function and, waiting and probing time is about the same thing, and an effective system size, okay? So we have a very nice results for this uh, fluctuation dissipation ratio. We have um, the pieces, I mean the high correlation part in which we have the linear behavior, and then we have a departure from the, from the theorem, the flotation dissipation theorem, that uh, goes to lower correlation, meaning longer time, when uh, the correlation grows and time passes, okay? What we are trying to do is trying to relate these shapes obtained at finite times and finite correlation lengths with equilibrium results on finite sites. So we have an statics dynamics scenario, uh, this scenario. Now, there have been attempts at doing that before, of course. Some by ourselves, other by Barada and Berthier, uh, so Cuyandolo and Marco Pico have done it. And many of those attempts, which were deemed to be successful, try to relate the effective size to the correlation length at the shortest of the two times, okay? So we have tried to do that and tried to get what the prediction of this effective uh, size will be, imagine that the, by imagining that the, the, the effective size was related only to the initial, to the correlation length and the initial time, when the, when the excuse me, the magnetic field was uh, switched on. As you see, we failed. So, We must assume that there are two length scales in the problem. We have the correlation length at the initial time and, <coughs> and the final time. And what we found is that the effective system size, as time goes by, saturates to be essentially proportional to the correlation length at the longest of the two times. Okay, we have an initial transcend, 
which to be open we don't understand. This is to be, to be honest, is what we, we don't understand very well is what happens exactly at the point where the, uh, the, the, the curve first deviates from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. This we don't understand very well, but the situation later is rather clear. So we have an initial time which basically, as those previous work found, uh, the relevant length was the correlation length at the initial time, but then as time goes by, the, the ruling length scale is the one at the proven time. Okay? As time goes by, the correlation length keeps growing, and this is the, the dominant uh, length scale in the problem. And we even have parameterized in a rather simple way the crossover between the dominance of the two length scales. Okay, so I can give you some conclusions about this part. So we have a new interpretation of this old dream of getting the Parisi functional loader parameter from the fluctuation dissipation experiment. This tells you or tell us that the future experiment could yield the Parisi order parameter for some effective size, which is an effective size which is much larger than anything we could do in experiment. However, the question will be which effective size? And to do that, we shall need a very strong command on the time behavior of the correlation length. So, <clears throat> the question is, we are providing so to say, uh, microscopic or theoretical estimate of this correlation length, and one could ask whether or not this is um, consistent with the microscopic determination that people find, experimental, fi experimental people find from the nonlinear responses. Okay, so this uh, takes me to my second question. And let me start from this plot that we have already seen. We have this very precise, very, very new precise results of the correlation length as a function of time, which, if one forgets about this short time um, funny behavior, looks very much linear on a log-log scale. Okay? They look linear, but they are not. I mean, if one just try to, to make a very stand simple fit in which one considers a quadratic dependence and just look at this coefficient C2. And we find that this coefficient C2 is, <coughs> if we plot this as a function of the uh, temperature in units of the critical temperature, what we find is that the precise at the critical temperature C2 seems compatible to be zero, but in the low temperature phase, there is a, a positive curvature. As far as I know, this is the first time that one can really measure this uh, curvature from numerical results. So, <coughs> We have found that the aging rate, this exponent zeta, depends on the length scale. And so, if we want to compare with experiments by Orbach, the question arises: at which length scale should compare her? So, <clears throat> the question is not so difficult to, to address because we have a, a film thickness, I mean, these people, uh, Ray Orbach and collaborators, have a film thickness that varies between 9 nanometers and 20 nanometers, and we know is the typical manganese-manganese distance. So, a simple division tells you that they are basically working at what we will call 38 lattice spacing. So, our problem is extrapolating our results, which are computed as a, a length scale of 12 lattice spacing to 38. I mean, this is an extrapolation, of course, but it's not a huge one. I mean, 38 is much closer than infinity. It's much easier to extrapolate to 38 than to extrapolate to infinity. And we have considered two possible extrapolation schemes. One I will call the, the Saclay divergent answer. Basically, it's a crossover to activate the dynamics. We have been, uh, Julio was talking to us about uh, the activated dynamics before. And in this answer, basically, uh, what people think is that the eventually the aging rate will be divergent, like a power law uh, with a, an exponent psi over the, of, of the correlation length. However, this thing is given by, actually by the ratio of two lengths. One is the Josephson length, which will be the analogous of the correlation length for a, uh, for a phase with the Goldstone bosons, and the other is the spin glass correlation length. So what really goes to the power of psi is the ratio of the two lengths. Hmm? Because these length scales, this Josephson length scale can be very large close to the critical point. The ratio can be very small until the, the, the glassy correlation length really grows up. Okay? 
in the experimental fits I have seen to this by the Sackler group to this uh, Paolo uh, they find exponents which are close to one around one okay in mean field computations I'm making the, the rather dirty assumption that you can take results at six dimension like mean field you will say that size should be around two but uh, although this is the preferred scaling droplet uh, as the scaling which is preferred by the, by the droplet theory I will say that uh, there are no clear uh, replica symmetry breaking predictions for this behavior okay on the other hand we have considered a convergent answer by convergent I mean that in the limit of the infinite correlation length the re aging rate will not be infinite okay however the convergence to this limit can be slow and we are assuming that it can be it, it is slow uh, as it is ruled by a power an inverse power of the correlation length dominated by the replicon exponent this replicon exponent is related with the k of the correlation function okay and let me mention that even if you analyze our data within the droplet picture which we have done uh, this replicon exponent which is zero in the droplet picture at the relevant length scale which is 38 lattice spacing is not zero yet is of the order of 0.28 while the replica symmetry breaking prediction is for about I would say 32, 0.32 or something so the two, the two theories are not really different on that point I mean they are different on the limit of an infinite uh, spin glass correlation length but not on that limit okay so it turns out that both answers can fit that very well very very well however the, the prediction at the length scale of 38 lattice species, uh, uh, species is very different. Okay? If we uh, plot our results in that way, I mean, we take out the, the temperature dependence to find a constant behavior, we find that the convergent ansat provides an extrapolation, I mean, uh, an extrapolation to 38, which is very close to 10. Pretty much temperature constant. Letting a cell will happen very close to the critical point, of course, but it is pre it's pretty much constant and close to 10. This is exactly what the, the Texans, our Texans friends found. found. And the divergent answer instead predicts a behavior which is uh, growing more violently with temperature as temperature is lower, and the values est um, extrapolated are significantly larger than the 10 that were found in the experiment. Okay, so it's <coughs> time for some conclusions. We had this uh, wonderful computer, Janus II, which are approaching us to the time and length scale which are really proved by experiments. We found that the data for the aging rate can really be fit with the both answers, both the convergent one and the divergent one. However, at variance, I would say, with the other attempts to use the divergent answer, the exponent size turns out to be something like 0.4. I mean, people were finding before something like 1, closer to 1, rather than 0.4. Uh, the two answers cannot be distinguished at the numerical level, but if you want to compare our results with the experimental ones, the convergent answer really seems to do a, a better job. This is only for amateurs, of spin glass amateurs or lovers, how do you say in English? Lovers? Um, fans, <laughs> okay, spin glass fans. There are, there are two randomization group fixed points and the relevant for us. The one is the one at the critical point, the other one is at zero uh, temperature. And uh, the numerical data has allowed us to really resolve the crossover. And uh, let me also state that the numerical accuracy is all important here. And it does also allow us to study some new memory effects like a Mempemba effect in, in the spin glasses. And I will say this is all. So happy birthday, Giorgio. And thank you so much for this wonderful collaboration. Okay, we have time for, for questions.
just a little advertising, say, we have some first results about uh, the crossover from two to three dimension, because this film geometry of experiment is important, and Ilaria Paga, that is getting our PhD in a joint program Madrid-Rome, is presenting a poster on that. So if anybody is interested to this transient, say, behavior and the statistical mechanical analysis of that, it is in a poster. Thank you. I should have said that, yes. Any other questions? Thank you, yeah. So, some very, very impressive work uh, involving a large number of people and many, many years. Um, how do you see the future? How do you... Uh, I don't see at the moment that people in, who believe in the droplet picture are being convinced by all these things. What is the end point and, and what do you hope to be the, uh, the follow-on uh, of applications in physics? After all, the spin, the spin glass materials have never been applied. What's been applied have been the mathematical techniques that it's developed. So where, how do you see the, the future results? Uh, well, I mean, the, impl the, uh, the importance of the final result. Well, okay. Um, first of all, I think this, uh, this can be interesting also for other type of glasses, not only for spin glasses. For instance, I mean, as you know, uh, getting a length scale in a, a, a typical lens scale, say in a supercooled liquid, has been a, a very difficult and a challenging problem for many years. So spin glasses are still stand probably as the only material in which you can get a very clear signal of a growing lens scale, both in a, at the theoretical and experimental side. So I guess only as a love tree of a glassy dynamics is probably worth studying. Also, there is a experimental progress. I mean, those new experiments by, by the, by the Texan peoples are giving a very accurate results. I mean, the, they were quoting seven themselves as the exponent for uh, this uh, exponent for the aging rate. And now they have so much more preserved results and they can say, okay, it's, I cannot, they cannot maintain any, any longer the distance. So I think this is experimental progress. And in as much there is an experimental progress, I think uh, 30s, should at least try to understand those, those experiments. You, you see that the technical developments in the computing can have the same implication for other areas as the analytic developments have done. Sorry. Did you hear that? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I could. Look, I don't know. Yeah. Look, I don't know. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Beautiful work, uh, indeed, very interesting. So my question is, if, you're, uh, if one of the goals in this uh, study, in these simulations you have been doing, is somehow trying to approach the experimental limit, which uh, is very interesting because then you have information from the both sides, have you ever think about going below, so in two dimensions, for example, where, uh, of course, there is no finite temperature transition, but still, uh, there must be at very low temperatures, a growing correlation length, and there may be two also experiments uh, on two-dimensional systems, and maybe there, the matching is much more straightforward. Yes, I, this, is, this is correct. In fact, the way uh, Orvag and, and collaborators describe this work is a crossover from 3D to 2D. I mean, in the, when the correlation length is small as compared to the film width, those are 3D experiments, but while well, they hit the, the, the width of the, of the film, the growth becomes two-dimensional. So those are essentially two-dimensional. And of course, this is essentially the, the, the new things we want to do now, is to, well, as Enzo said, we are doing some preliminary work on standard computers, but Janus, one of the beautiful things is that it can be programmed. I mean, uh, it can be programmed, so you can change a little bit the program, not much, but you can change it a little bit, and we are working on making film ge uh, geometry, so to, as you said, start studying the, the 3D to 2D crossover. 
Okay, now we have a break, so let's thank again the speakers, and we'll be back in uh, about 25 minutes. <laughs>